Perfect. Okay. Hi, everyone. It's Gordon Einstein, your resident-friendly Dubai crypto attorney, uh, continuing my series of fascinating conversations with people who I know like or was recently introduced to, and, and now I like, but all the best brains in crypto. And today we have a fascinating guest and a fascinating topic, something that is definitely not in my realm of knowledge, but something I've been curious about for a while, just being where I am and being interested in crypto. Um, okay, please, just so I don't embarrass myself, say, dear guest, please say your name properly, and then I'll, I'm going to do my best. <laughs> That's just okay. My name is Muawiyah. That's fine. My name is Muawiyah Tucker. Uh, I'm from London, born and raised. Um, and um, I'm here to, to take part in this conversation. Thank you. And thank you for making the time. Uh, you were We were introduced to each other by the illustrious Bruce Fenton of Satoshi Roundtable and many other things. And Bruce and I recorded a show maybe a week, week, week and a half ago that is going to broadcast actually tomorrow. Um, and then he told me something I didn't know, which, which is kind of interesting. He, he's reverted to Islam. And yeah, that yeah. led to a whole interesting conversation. And then he mentioned you. And I've always been interested in the interaction between Sharia, which I do not, you know, I'm a neophyte. I, I barely know anything. But there yeah. is. But it is the interaction between Sharia and blockchain and crypto. What's yeah. allowed, what's not allowed, how the legal set or legal principles from Sharia tr transport over to this new technology, this new way of doing business, this new way of communicating value and records. And, you know, is, is it compatible in full? Is it incompatible? It's like, what, what, how do you need to work through it? And then he mentioned you as being an expert on the topic. And I was like, well, we, we have to do a show. So this is going to be one of those shows where it's explaining it to me like I'm five, because when it comes to this topic, I really am like five. But I'm, yeah, that's I'm, I'm eager to learn, and this is the right place to learn. So thank you again for coming on. Thank you. Um, before we dive into the intense discussion, I always like with our guests to get a little bit of background. So you, you kind of let off a little bit, but where are you from? You know, what was your experience? What, do you, what did you study? Where, where did you travel? And then what brought you to to crypto? So go. Yeah, so my, uh, just like friend, uh, Bruce Fenton, um, I myself also became Muslim. I was born and raised in a Christian family. Uh, mm -hmm. I used to go to a Christian school growing up. And then when I was in college, um, I, I, I was exposed to Islam. I did my own research. And then eventually I accepted Islam in college. Mm -hmm. um, and then about, about a year later, uh, I got married. And about six months later, I got accepted to study um, Islamic law in the Islamic University, the Islamic University of Medina, which is in Saudi Arabia. Wow. Um, so I spent eight years um, doing completing a degree in Islamic law. So I literally gone from one world, <laughs> one world in the UK, and literally jumped into an entirely different world. So that's one one reason why I kind of see myself as almost like a, almost like a bridge, mm -hmm. because before Islam, I was very much into maths, physics, and, and computing. Um, I even wanted to be an astronaut at one point. Um, and uh, and I think that's kind of how that, that kind of um, became that bridge almost because when I well, when I became exposed to Bitcoin, mm -hmm. it kind of reignited that interest I have. Well, I mean, I always had always had interest anyway in computing because I, mean, I, 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 already, I already do web, web design and, and coding that kind of stuff. I'm already in that space already because I have knowledge in PHP and JavaScript and that kind of stuff. So when I heard about Bitcoin and internet money, it was it was it was an obvious thing. It was like, obviously why not? Um, so in two thousand and seventeen, mm -hmm. um, this is that's as far as I can remember. I mean, I have I have, I have evidence on my phone that I was I was looking into Bitcoin in two thousand sixteen, but mm -hmm. I don't remember it. But I do remember in two thousand sixteen uh, seventeen, I was updating my website, and I and I had some issues with PayPal, mm -hmm. as as you do, <laughs> as you do, and I said to myself, well, why is it so difficult to get paid? online i mean i can i can share any content i want i can do anything i need to do online why is it so difficult to get paid online and i said to myself let me see if i can integrate bitcoin payments onto my website so i found a solution to get in bitcoin payments i went to coinbase um because that was i don't know how i came to coinbase being a, a, a source of bitcoin but i bought some bitcoin on coinbase i tested the transaction does it work it worked. I received a payment. I was like, "Yeah, great." And that was July. That was July in uh, July uh, 2017. And then I got back 
because you know I've done what I had to do. I, I've I've updated, I've updated my website. I I can receive Bitcoin payments. I wasn't expected to get paid in Bitcoin, but you know, me never know. And then a month later, um, I went to check on if any if I've been paid or any, if I received received any payments, mm -hmm. and I noticed that there was more money there than I than I than I had put in there before when I tested it, and I was like, oh, did I get paid? And it, I did it. But it was the money and, that and, I had sorry, used. I, I think I missed something. What, what was the website selling or what, what what was the transactions? Yeah, so essentially when I graduated from the University of Medina, my my main focus was education, teaching. So teaching Arabic and Islamic studies and that kind of stuff. So it was education-based or service-based technology um, um, website. Mm -hmm. So when I saw that the, there was more money than when I first tested it, I was curious, did I get paid? Mm -hmm. But I didn't. And then I noticed that the Bitcoin I had had gone up quite a bit mm -hmm. in that one month period. I was like, okay, why did that? Why did that happen? Well, and I, I, say, I, I understand. It's not, you looked and it looked like there was more Bitcoin, but it's not that there was more. It's that what we have became more valuable in the interim. Yes. 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 So I didn't see the I didn't, I didn't see the Bitcoin value. I mean, Bitcoin to a newbie, Bitcoin is just numbers. I mean, you you can't quantify how much it is. All I know all, all I know is that I sent over I think like forty or thirty pounds. As the as the test transaction, but when I went back there again, it was like forty or it was like ten pounds extra. So I was like, why? Why is it? Why is there more, 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 more fiat or more money? Mm -hmm. And that led me down the rabbit hole. What is Bitcoin? Um. Now, one thing that was one unique journey that came with me with Bitcoin is that. Um. I was never interested in Bitcoin because I wanted to make more fiat. Mm -hmm. Uh, I, I I was already a gold bug because I always wanted to exit the fiat system um, because of the, the the Islamic stance as it relates to interest and that kind of stuff and, and banking. So I've always wanted to exit and, and, and be outside of the system. And I figured that Bitcoin would be an avenue to do that. It's just that when I saw that the value had gone up, I felt there was a need Can to I figure jump out what's happening. I'm sorry, it's, it's my style. I, I interrupt when I get interested. Yeah, it's fine. Okay, you, you're, you're saying something that hadn't occurred to me before. Which is, I always think, I always wonder how Sharia interacts with crypto, but now you're making me think about it. I can't believe I haven't thought about this before. If you have a debt-based or fractional or reserve-based banking system, which, you know, it's a form of debt. It's not quite a commercial loan debt, but it's a form of debt. It is... Yes. We're going we're gonna to have to get into reba and all this other stuff, which I barely just touched on. But is the current fractional reserve banking system somewhat at odds with Islamic financial principles? Yeah, hundred percent, hundred percent. That was yeah, that was that was my motivation from 2012. So 2012, I was a big gold bug, saying yeah, we have to return to the gold standard, we have to leave this other thing. But the problem is, as you can imagine, gold has inherent problems yes it's sound money yes you can't print gold mm -hmm. but fundamentally we don't live in in 1855 where by doing trade i have to travel to the next village on, on horse and cart we live in a in a digital age where we have uh, you know long distance payments we can't be carrying around pieces of gold everywhere mm -hmm. you can't i mean i can't even break a piece of gold off. I, i'm not going to carry around clippers to try and break pieces of gold into smaller pieces so practically speaking Every gold bug mm. um, finds themselves at odds with reality. You can't really wave the flag for gold and be realistic about about life. <laughs> not in not in in our days. I mean, that, that's why you find. I always say that that gold bugs, they they're kind of doomers, as in that their world only really works if everything reverts back to horse and cart and 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 and, and candles. You, you have to remove modern society for gold to really work. Or even be a, a, an option because it doesn't it doesn't work in the digital age. Right, That's just, why you find a lot of gold, gold bugs. They always they always say to you, "What are you going to do with your Bitcoin if there's a nuclear war and we revert, and we, and we revert back to to the old days?" So mm -hmm. you, you see that you, you can see inherently within their narrative, it's 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 um, grounded in that old world. It's not really today. It's not really relevant today, and that's actually why we have fiat. Fiat is solves the problem of gold, so um, that's why when I became a gold bug, mm -hmm. the I, the narrative was was good. It was sound in my head, but practically, gold is gold. You can't use gold, which is why when I came across Bitcoin, it was okay. It has properties of gold, 
Mm -hmm. but it also has the useful property properties of fiat where i could transit transact long distance and so on and so forth so to me it felt like an obvious transition or an obvious solution to to the problems that muslims face when it comes to banking all right I so mean, let's, that's... sorry let, 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 let's go back to the gold thing for a second is, is your yes the, the all, all the issues of with gold are i agree you know there's security issues you know you can't make change with it you know it's you don't know the purity of it necessarily so two questions yeah. does and i agree with all that two related questions does gold backed currencies like the dollar before it went off the gold standard and other international currencies when you basically have a depository receipt for gold that you, you know at that at that time you have trust that you can just go to the bank and exchange it does, does that address your gold bug objections and my second question, just to give you, just to let you anticipate it, is related, which is, does, does the modern tokenization of gold allow you to revert a bit to being a gold bug? So let's take it one at a time. Historically, does a gold-backed um, paper system, exchangeable, uh, or being on the gold standard, address the concern? Yeah, so the, the idea of, of uh, in Arabic, it's called like a wathiqa, or like a... a, 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 a um, Almost like a deed or a claim, a, a, a trustworthy claim on an asset. That's yeah. perfectly fine, and um, uh, and that has been used obviously historically to facilitate and allow the use of gold. But as you can, as you know from history, that also led to the centralization of gold. Okay. But more, 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 which is not a problem, by the way. Islamically speaking, it's not a problem having someone else look after your gold, and then you can transact with the certificates. There's nothing wrong with that. Mm -hmm. Um, but what the problem now comes in is the issue of trust and issue of fractional or fractionalizing these certificates, which is where we have fractional reserve banking, you could say. The moment that certificate no longer is a representation of what it's supposed to represent, that is now fraud. You're essentially transacting in what doesn't exist. And there's a very uh, important principle in Islamic finance or Islamic business mm -hmm. that you can't sell what you don't have. It's a very fundamental principle. You can't sell something I don't have. So if, for example, I have um, a car mm -hmm. and, for example, uh, let's, just, let's just say, for example, the car has been seized by the government and they're going to threaten to crush this car unless X has been paid. Now, technically, it's my car. I mean, it is my car. It's in my name. But I don't actually have possession of it. I mean, technically, the government's taken it and they, can, they could crush it if, the, if, if that would be the case. Yes. I actually, Islamically speaking, can't sell that car unless I secure the asset. Because if I can't secure the asset, I have no guarantees to finalize the deal. So what are we agreeing on? What, 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 on what basis are we transacting? I can't transact with you on something. I can't fulfill the, the, uh, the, 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 the conditions of the transaction. So, fra so fundamentally, um, fractional reserve it, uh, banking is totally at odds um, with Islam because on, on, on the one hand, it's selling what you don't have. But on the other hand, when you start charging interest for that, again, Islam is very strict about monetizing debt. Um, debt is not something that one could profit from. And there are certain things Islamically you can't profit from. So you can't pro profit from death. So for example, I can't, if I know that there are two nations at a civil war, mm -hmm. I can't now see the opportunity there and say, okay, I'm gonna sell arms to both sides. Because essentially, I am profiting from the death of others. So there are certain things that, that certain types of trade in Islam that are prohibited for ethical reasons, for practical reasons. And, you know, that this is where these things come at odds. So back to the issue of, 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 the issue of, a, of a loan. Mm. Um, the basis of a loan is that someone is in need. I don't have the money. So I've come to you asking a favor, asking you to help me in my time of need so islam islam says in that situation in that state is not for you to capitalize on his uh, misfortune you could say you know on his on his on his need yeah, on his vulnerability that's the word you, you capitalize on his vulnerability mm. um and that's why you can you, you can you can imagine you can imagine even if you just run a, a thought experiment you can imagine a society deep rooted in, in, in interest you can imagine that there'll be a class of people who become predatory, who whereby people. I, 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 don't, I don't have to imagine. I mean, there, there are a class of people who are predatory. I mean, it's, it's yeah, not. A, so... it's, I don't have to watch a movie. It's real. <laughs> but, 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 I, I'm sorry. Let me let me 
let me go back to one second. Okay, so just just thinking on gold for a second. So there, there's not a fundamental objection to having gold on deposit and issuing no. certificates against it. There's not a fundamental no. objection to having a currency based on the gold standard and for convenience have issuing you know uh, paper money, but that's backed one for one with gold, where you yeah. get into where you start crossing the threshold into trouble is fractional reserve banking. It sounds like that's not a REBA prohibition. That sounds like a prohibition against you can't sell what you don't have. Yes. Yeah, so it's, it's multi-layered. It's multi-layered. It's not just one thing because, like I said, the the if the, if if you look at the, the what, what is the contract? What is the agreement? Okay. This certificate is supposed to represent X yes. amount in the bank. That if you were to go to the bank, you can claim that thing back. But if yeah. I issue a certificate that represents something that does that the person cannot give if you wish to claim it, then you have fraud here. That's the that's, that's basic, that's basic definition of fraud. I don't have the thing to give you. That's why in an Islamic um, trade, it's just normal trade. Mm -hmm. If I was to, for example, for example there, there are many examples in, in the prophetic narration or the prophetic tradition, mm -hmm. that if you was to buy stock to sell on the market, before you even attempt to sell it, you're supposed to you say, you're supposed to gain possession of that thing. Even, even if it means cornering it off into a space whereby it is yours and no one else can touch it. That At the very least, you have to designate that this is mine and nobody else's. So then I can now negotiate deals with other people. Um, now, there is a caveat here. There is a caveat here. This doesn't, this doesn't exclude um, production. So for example, if I was to produce something in the future, that's now that's a, that's a separate that's a separate contract whereby I make an agreement to say I I'm, I say look I, it's called selling whereby you would advance me capital and then I would you know produce the thing you want to produce like whether it's be phones whether it be uh, farming you know, you know if I want to produce potatoes or wheat that's that's fine you can make a, a forward contract you can say a forward contract for the delivery of a product but even then the reason why this is an exception to the rule is because Number one, what is um, what the agreement is, is upon a description, not a specific thing. So, for example, if I was to sell you a car with license plates, one, two, three, four, five, mm -hmm. that's a, an agreement on a specific car. And in order for me to conclude that, that, that agreement, I have mm -hmm. to have possession of that specific car. But if I was a car dealer, dealership, and I agreed to sell you a yellow Mercedes, mm -hmm. With specific, and I specify specific, it has that this type of engine, this type of upholstery, this type. I've, de I've designated a description of what a car looks like, and the contract is on that description. Then I don't have to have possession of the thing, I just have to just deliver it on the particular times. So there is a slight difference in that regards. But regards to the issue of, of, of fractional reserve, mm -hmm. if I cannot deliver you by definition, the, the everyone, the, 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 the product my different definition is is false it's, it's multi-layered it's multi-layered in that regards but the issue of the interest comes later on because fractional reserve only really functions if you introduce um uh, if you if you introduce um or what we call riba or or interest and i and i use that word loosely mm -hmm. because there are there are cases in english where interest is not riba and there are cases where something is called riba and it's not interest so there is an overlap mm -hmm. Let, let, let me pause you there because my neophyte explained to me my like a my brain um, loosely equates Reba, which I kind of use without us identifying that word with interest. And yeah. can you can you slowly give me the definition of Reba? So Reba, Reba, Reba in the Arabic language means increase. Okay, literally, literally just means to increase. Um, so if I was to increase my yield in farming, I can use the word yieldable, which means I've increased the yield of my farming. So it, the word just means to increase. Okay. But in terms of the 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 definition, the specific technical definition as it relates to trade, mm. then riba is of two. It, it, it number one, it only applies to fungible items. Okay. Yeah. So items that are not fungible, there is no such thing as riba. Meaning. Um, if I was to borrow from you a camel mm -hmm. and I said to you, I need to borrow this camel because I, I want to do some Ubering on my camel. <laughs> I want to do my Uber, Uber camel. I want to do some taxi on my camel for a year. I need to borrow a camel. Mm -hmm. And when I give the camel back, I'll give you another camel. So I'm giving back two 
for one. Mm, okay. That's not riba because a camel is not fungible. I can't divide a camel into smaller camels that are equal in value and weight and whatnot. A camel is not a camel. Camel riba only applies to fungible items. So a kilogram of gold, if I half that, I'll have half a kilogram or two halves of a kilogram of gold. To, to the point whereby if I put them back together again, they're back. They're, they're exactly the same value, weight, quantity. They, they're fungible. We all know what fungibility is. Same thing with um, with lots of other things like like metals that kind of stuff. So with those fungible assets, mm. that and this is this was key. The reason my fung non fungible assets are excluded is because there's no realistic way. Listen carefully. There's no realistic or practical way to um, quantify equality. Okay. What does it mean to say, I give you back the same camel I took? What does that mean? Every camel is different. There's no way to actually quantify how much a camel you gave me first and how much am I giving you back as a camel. There's no way. Because every camel, by definition, is different. You know, but one kilogram of gold... It, it might be the topic, but for some reason, like we're, we're getting the sun, sun blast behind me. So <laughs> I'm going to stop my video for one second and I'm going to lower the blinds. Okay, hold on one second, okay? Just give me a second. That's fine. Right, thanks. One second. Yes, fine. <clears throat> wow. You know, that's the first time that's ever happened on the show. So <laughs> maybe, 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 maybe it's a sign. Okay. Um, but we yeah, run so while saying, Wait, let's go I, back I, a bit. Yeah, let's go back a step. Thank you very much. So yeah. let's go back a step. Let's go back a step. So number one, the topic of riba, uh, which is loosely, tra loosely translated interest, only applies to things that can be accurately and uh, correctly quantified. I understand. So you say a kilogram of gold, yesterday, tomorrow, next year, it will be the kilogram of gold. It will be exactly the same. And I can quantify the amounts. And I can even say, I can even gather together pieces of gold until I get a whole kilogram. And that whole kilogram is equal to a bar. It's, there's, there's, we, know, we know what fungibility means. So it has, it's fungible. Okay, so Whereas you, things that are non-fungible, so this, this is begging the question, is does RIBA, and sorry if I'm mispronouncing it, apply to non-fungible tokens? No. No, it doesn't. Okay, that's interesting. Wow. I never thought about because, that. Because, like I said, if, for example, like I said, if I, if, I was to, if I was to say to you, look, um, let's just say I'm hungry, really hungry. Mm. And I say, can I, can, I, can I borrow from you two potatoes so I can eat today? I'm hungry. They say, oh, here you go. Here's two potatoes. Pay me back two potatoes tomorrow. How how could I possibly quantify and make my two potatoes two potatoes I give to you tomorrow to be the same as what I got today? There's there's no way because right. no two potatoes are the same. So to to impose upon us equality on something that cannot be equal would be what what we call in Arab in, in Islamic law uh, to lay upon someone the responsibility that they can't fulfill. You can't fulfill that. You can't fulfill that responsibility. I can't give you back the equal amount. So if I gave you back two potatoes, or three smaller ones, or four smaller ones that you're happy with, that's fine because there's it's 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 a rough estimate. Whereas gold, mm -hmm. if I gave you a gram of gold, I can give you back a gram. You know that we can quantify the gram. We can measure the gram, and that gram will be exactly the same as we had before. So there is a way of having equality, and that's why. Um, we can do that. So, and that's actually why, and another interesting point, why, for example, when you have cross assets, let's say gold and silver, mm. I lend you gold and you pay me, pay me back silver. Okay. Well, what's the consequence? Gold and silver, the gold, gold and silver are not equal. The price of gold and price of silver fluctuates. So how can I possibly give you back silver the exact same as gold in terms of weight? It, it, it wouldn't make sense. Mm -hmm. So I can differ in the weight of the gold and silver as long as these two things are concluded, what they call hal, or concluded immediately. I mean, we're going to be going into the weeds, but essentially, um, number one, if I was to take a loan from you mm -hmm. and I'm lending and I'm borrowing from you a fungible asset, I have to give you back exactly the same amount in the 
in the means and mechanism that is, is measured. So if it's gold, you measure gold in weight. If it's, for example, um, what we call volume, some things are measured in volume, volumetric. Yes. For example, if I was to buy, if I was to get from you rice, rice is 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 exchanged in volume. Now, you know, when you when you when you're making dinner, you make a cup of rice. I mean, I know some some cooking books that say a kilogram of rice or, or, or how many grams, but realistically, it's a cup. Because a cup of rice is a cup of rice. You know, we all know what a cup of rice can achieve, and that's and that's that's the, the thing. But you don't like you don't sell oil. That, that's clearly there. You go there. You go a barrel of oil. Right. Perfect. Yes. Yeah. So that's that's the best example today because um, one could argue that today some people do sell rice in weight, but mm. oil is one of those things that yeah, you don't sell oil in 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 grams or in um, kilograms. You, you sell oil in barrels. That's that'd be an example. Yeah. So that's that's a, a basic prohibition in Islam from any type of lending um, that increase that 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 causes an increase that causes um, an increase in um, paying something back. So I basically can't, I can't, I can't monetize that. Um, okay, so good explanation. Now, bring these principles to, you covered a lot, and I know there's more to cover. Bring these principles to, before, not crypto, but blockchain. Is there any issue or... Do they work together? Do they kind of fight each other? What, what, what's the on pure blockchain? Is there any? Yeah. Like so with the with the topic of blockchain, blockchain is just a, it's just a, it's just a a a part of a whole. So blockchain is used in Bitcoin to establish a time uh, you can say a timestamp or or continuity that you know one thing happened before the other. Yes. Um, but Bitcoin exists on the blockchain, so Bitcoin has no existence outside of the actual blockchain. Um, so you say it's, it's an asset that's intrinsically tied to the blockchain. But you have some assets that you could say are external from the blockchain. And this is where we have now, we, we actually go back to what you draw a uh, question on with regards to backing of gold with certificates. Mm -hmm. So imagine I use the blockchain idea to issue certification on real world assets. Then it's a different, it's a, it's a totally, totally different thing to Bitcoin. We're not using the blockchain to uh, quantify an asset on the blockchain, you're only using the blockchain as just a, a means to record a series of transactions. So rather than using papers and stamps like we did in the past, we're using the blockchain. So in that, in that regards, blockchain is it's not it's a, it's it's an irrelevant discussion because it doesn't doesn't it doesn't it doesn't it doesn't actually uh, it's not really involved in the in the in the in the, in the conversation or in the, even the transaction because the transaction is not really about the blockchain itself. With, with the, the transaction is about the asset. Okay, so I, imagine I, I, I agree with you. I just, I just want to go step by step. I agree with you. My that was my suspicion. Now let, let's take it up a layer. Okay, so we have the base underlying technology, which is non-controversial. Specifically, and we'll cut the, cover the other ones. Specifically, Bitcoin is what, what's the Sharia point of view on Bitcoin? Yeah, so with Bitcoin, one of the the, the contentions and the you guys the confusion and and the uh, apprehension some have had towards Bitcoin. <clears throat> mm -hmm. Is because Bitcoin was and is a dramatic shift in the think thought process of mankind, as in throughout history. Medium, we've never really had a real life asset that was transferable that mm -hmm. wasn't tangible. I okay. mean, I if I have a poem, a poem I could say a poem has value. There's no way of transferring the poem from my head to your head to the point where but I no longer have it and you do. If, if I gave it to you, now you have a copy and I have a copy. There's no way of transferring what I have to what you have. Right. And even if you was to establish like copyright laws or, or patent laws, those are only enforced in the abstract. You know, it, there's nothing really ab enforced in reality. I could still copy your poem and publish it in... In China, if I wanted to, there's nothing really stopping hey, that from happening. Let, let me stop because that's a very interesting point you're making. And I'm, I'm, you know, I'm a lawyer, so I'm responding to this as a lawyer. You just made a very interesting point I haven't thought about, which is when you have a government imposed monopoly like intellectual property, you're the thing making it someone not the thing creating scarcity is not the actual absence of the physical thing, it's a, le yeah. it's a legal construct which isn't yeah. physically reflected. So you don't yeah, yeah. Which really is, have scarcity, you have a legal artificial. scarcity. Yeah, Interesting. artificial okay. scarcity. Okay. So, so Bitcoin actually made real scarcity of an abstract thing. 
which we never had before. Nice. Before okay. we only had uh, legally enforced scarcity, not real scarcity. That's why. That's why. I mean, even me personally, I don't hold patterns contracts in the same regard as in from Islam from Islam perspective. I I find it difficult to 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 um to enforce or or or, or enforce ownership to an idea. If I came to your house and I saw you had made a table, mm -hmm. I thought that's a really great idea. What makes it? What makes what what makes you having that idea have rights over my wood and my tools that I can't do the same? So ideas, there is no. We've never really had an I and the thing in history, uh, the thing that I can own, an idea because an idea, I, I I nothing is taken from you by me applying the same idea, unless we enforce a legal legal construct. But Bitcoin is different though. I can actually okay, show. This is, this is a, I love this conversation. Let, let, let's just stay in there for a second. The, um, and I did do some work in this area of law. The, the, the classic argument would be, and it, it actually says in the U.S. Constitution, it's in order to, the general argument would be that we want to provide an incentive, economic incentive to creators, to inventors to invent, creators can create, and writers to write, and so forth. And yeah. sometimes people do this just because they do it. But sometimes, you know, especially in the case of patents, we have a physical tool or implementation they're producing. They need some way to benefit from that economically over time or else yeah. what's the point? Because the world yeah. history is full of inventors coming up with good ideas and then other people running with them and the inventors left penniless. So you, it's kind of the protection of the little guy. That would be the argument. Yeah, I, 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 I'm fully aware of the, the argument. And there's lots of counter arguments as well, which I don't I don't want to deviate the discussion somewhere else. But the point is, is that okay. Okay, okay. In, in conclusion, well, we'll, that, we'll do that in part two. In, in the part two, yeah. But the, the, the concept in the, in the head is that with Bitcoin, mm -hmm. it is something that is actually enforceable. As in, if I have Bitcoin in my wallet, mm -hmm. you, 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 you have no access to that thing. And I can transfer it to you and I no longer have access to that thing. And this is what make this is what makes the concept of Bitcoin absolutely new because it never existed before, and because of that, many struggled with the idea of what Bitcoin was. Hence, why you have people saying, "What is Bitcoin? Bitcoin is nothing. You know, it's not tangible." Because, okay. because in in if you go to the past, property rights were easily enforced because you can't have two of the same thing. If I have a chair, if I have the chair in my house, mm -hmm. that's almost evidence to some degree that it's mine i mean i because yes. it, the share is not in my employ my house and your house at the same time so property rights i can easily come and say look as a judge i deem that the chair belongs to him i can lift that chair out of your home and give it to him and that's it but an idea how do i lift the idea of your head and give it to someone else i can't do that so ideas have always been different from real life things, but Bitcoin has been very, very different. So to answer your question, is Bitcoin from a mature perspective halal? Mm -hmm. It is because if you look at the reality of Bitcoin, although it isn't physical, it embodies all the realities of physical property in terms of ownership. I can actually transfer ownership in a, in a provable way, in a, in a manifest way. I mean, that's why you have theft. Because I, I mean, for example, if I came to your home, as an example, if I came to your home and I broke open your safe and I read your documents, your special documents, your special formula for Coca-Cola, mm -hmm. I can put your, your thing back into your safe, close the safe, leave, and you have no idea that I have to have it because I haven't taken anything from you. Yes. Whereas a Bitcoin, if I, if I went to your safe and I, and I swept your wallet and you go to it, you now see it is gone. So you can see that although Bitcoin is digital, it embodies the physical realities of physical properties. So that's why people, people argue, oh, Bitcoin's not tangible. I kind of smile because yes, it isn't tangible, but it very much is. So it's it's a, it's, a, it's it's almost it's almost like saying it's it's Bitcoin. I would say what Bitcoin did, it redefined the reality of tangible. That tangible doesn't actually mean physical anymore. Tangible could actually mean something else. It could actually mean something else. Um, so that's 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 um, uh, one of the things. Right? This is a very novel and interesting argument for me, the or position I should say. So l let me try to repeat back to you what I think I'm hearing, and then you can correct me. In traditional Islamic law, or under Islamic principles, there's this idea that you 
you have to actually own something in order to sell it. And it's against the rules to sell something you don't have, barring exceptions and all this other stuff. But that, that's a general principle. So I think there would be a native suspicion of intangible property under Islamic finance because you're begging the question, how can you sell this thing if you don't actually have it? And then you get all these kind of esoteric debates about whether legal, you know, Western legal principles actually make it so you have it. And I, I can see the, the tension that's inherent there. The, the argument you're making is that maybe the traditional Islamic finance mind and the traditional American legal mind would look at Bitcoin and because it looks intangible like patent and, and, and copyright, there might be a suspicion of it, of how could you possibly sell this thing or deal with it because you're selling something you don't actually have. Your point is, don't be fooled, clever guy. Just because it looks like an idea, just because it looks intangible, the, the fact that you, the first time ever, have scarcity, where me transmitting a digital good to you removes it from me and gives it to you in a provable way, makes it look like what came before, but it's fundamentally different. And therefore, the prohibition about selling what you don't have doesn't apply. Am I understanding you? Correctly? Yes, that is that is 99% there. This is one 99%, caveat. 99%, okay. 1% this is This one caveat. And okay. that is a, there's a, there's there's a distinction between ownership and possession. Mm -hmm. I yeah. can own something, but not possess it. Yeah. The position that what I mentioned before is selling what you don't possess and own. They're, they're not the same. So I maybe I wasn't clear initially, but let me clar let me re clarify that. So let me let's 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 go through the scenarios. I can Islamically speaking sell something I don't own. I can do that. I can physically sell something I don't own as long as get permission from the owner. Like an agent. Yes. Okay. But so I agent, can't sell right. something I have no possession over. Okay. Even, if, even if I'm the owner, I don't have possession over it. That's different. Oh, that's interesting. So let me give you, let me give you a classic example. I and mean, let's, let's talk about it in terms of Bitcoin. Uh, Mount Gox. We all know Mount Gox. Yes. Imagine I had Bitcoin in Mount Gox. Now Bitcoin is tied up in Mount Gox. How much of it will I get back? I don't know. It's still going through the process. The whole time that this case is going ahead, if I said to you, look, I've got some Bitcoin in Mount Gox. I'll sell you the Bitcoin in Mount Gox now. You give me the money for the Bitcoin, and then you have now the claim of the Bitcoin on Mount Gox. That transaction doesn't exist in Islam. I can't do that. Because I have no capacity to give it to you, and I have no knowledge if, I even, even, if, if it'll even happen in the future. Maybe, maybe I won't get it back. Mm -hmm. So... Possession and ownership aren't necessarily connected. I can sell something I don't possess, but I own. Um, so yeah, sorry, I can sell something I don't own uh, as long as I can give it to you, as long as I don't get permission from the owner. But I can't sell something I cannot give when required to give. So okay. um, that's why, for example, let's, let's, imagine, let's imagine, for example, I came to you and you're selling a car. I said, okay, I want to buy this car. How much for? A thousand dollars. Cool. Can I have the keys? If I have the money, can I have the keys? Not yet. The keys of my wife, she's just traveling somewhere far. And um, when she comes back, I'll give it to you. So now I'll say, okay, when she comes back, we'll do we'll, we'll conclude. Because maybe she won't come back. Maybe she gets robbed along the way. Maybe maybe there's not maybe there's no way of me getting the car in the end. And that's why in the, the, the scholars, mm -hmm. they've given examples in the books of Islamic law of examples of prohib prohibited transactions. They say something like, uh, imagine you have a camel who's run away. You own the camel in a legal framework. The camel belongs to you, mm -hmm. but he's run away. I can't sell you a runaway camel. I can only say, look, I have a camel who's run away. If you want to buy it off me, we can do, we can, we can formulate the framework of a transaction. But when I get it back, we can conclude. But until I have the camel back, we can't conclude that the transaction doesn't, doesn't, it hasn't materialized. It's not there. We can have four more, you can also call the heads of memorandum, memorandums, you know, we call the heads of terms, that this is what we want to do. But I can easily walk away until I have the capacity to give it to you. Same thing to say, like, for example, selling a bird in the, in the, car, in the sky. If a bird is flying in the sky, mm -hmm. I can say to you, look, I'll, I'll sell you that bird in the sky. The bird's flying. I have no way to give you the bird. Until I have the capacity to to convey and give you the bird, mm -hmm. even at least even if it's in, in principle, I can't conclude the deal. I, so, I, I get it. It's, I get it. It's, it's interesting. And the possession versus ownership distinction 
Makes sense. That's why in the um, that's why in the in the the fatwa the the, the uh, I made a, a collection of fatwa on Bitcoin. One of the fatwas that I issued. One of the, by the way, just to clarify for people, to people think that fatwa means death death sentence. <laughs> From the Khomeini days, they make fatwa means a death sentence. In Islam, a fatwa only means the answer to a question. If you came to me with a question, I gave you an answer. That mm -hmm. answer is called a fatwa. So that's why my thing is, is, is framed as a series of questions and answers. Mm -hmm. One of the, the distinctions I made is in terms of what, is, what does it mean to a transaction in Bitcoin? So if I said to you, I bought a car from you and I sent you the Bitcoin, what, at what point is the transaction done? Is it when, when it's inside the block or is it when it's inside the mempool? What does it mean to actually do the transaction? And this is where we have the distinction between a financial transaction mm. and the technologically the technological reality. I can give you Bitcoin, mm. but it's not actually in the blockchain yet. It's yours, but on the blockchain it's different. Does it make sense? No, of course. There's a distinction between between I can, what I, I can agree. Backward, sell it, sell it to you with a piece of paper, but until I actually Perfect. transmit it on the blockchain, possession hasn't changed at the very least. Yeah, well, that, that's the thing. So many Bitcoiners, they'll say, not your keys, not your coin. Meaning that if it's not in your wallet, it's not yours. That, on a technical level, I get that. Because, you know, um, on a technical level, they, they, if from a Bitcoiner's perspective, they're talking, talking about issue of, of enforcement. The blockchain enforces the fact that this is yours. But on a Sharia perspective, imagine I sent you Bitcoin. Yeah, so I bought something off of you. I sent you the Bitcoin. We parted company. For some reason, the Bitcoin has stayed in the mempool for a very, very long time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then for some reason, it dropped from the mempool. So now it's not, you're not going to get it in the end. Okay. Does that mean a transaction is null and void? No, it doesn't mean that. It just means I owe you what I was supposed to send you. And the transaction still concluded. It still happened. It's just now, it's, not, it's, almost, it's, it's, it's almost become like a debt. I owe you. I still owe you the Bitcoin. I can still come to you, come to you say, look, it's not in my wallet. Could you please send it to me? Mm -hmm. And he said, no, 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 I'm not giving it to you. You now can go to court and say to him, look, here's the transaction. Here's the receipt of payment. I didn't receive the money. The judge will say, yes, you are legally obliged to receive this money. You haven't received it yet, but legally speaking, the transaction was concluded. It's still yours. So there is a, there is a, there is a slight distinction between what is reflected on the blockchain and what is reflected in reality. I'll give me, let me give another one, one good, good example, because I had this, I had a meeting with um, uh, one of the, the employees of the land registry, the UK land registry. So apparently mm -hmm. UK land registry were exploring using blockchain for um, land registry registration. Okay. And I basically said to them that using blockchain for land registry uh, seems pointless. That was the conclusion at the end because it's possible, really? it's feasible, Again. As a as a blockchain, the idea of blockchain is immutable. You can't change what's in the blockchain. Once it's happened, it's happened. But in your own legal system, I can imagine a scenario whereby the transaction was illegal, but it's in blockchain. How do you how do you roll back that transaction? You can't by definition, you can't roll back a transaction. So no, you have to disconnect. You, 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 it is a ledger. You, you could do you could treat it like a normal ledger. You, you have your bad transaction. You find out about a letter, and then you make a correcting entry. Yeah, so so that that, that's, that that was my point. My point was, why use a blockchain then? You can just use any form of technology. Why go to the most inefficient form of of, of a ledger where you okay. can use MySQL if wanted to? You can, they, they are, you don't. My point is, you don't have to use a, a a blockchain to do that. If you look at efficiency, okay, you want to go for the most efficient, easy way of doing so. And if you're talking about UK land registry, you're essentially talking about the land ownership rules within a set border controlled and managed by yourselves using the blockchain you're losing control of what essentially is your domain i mean by definition blockchain will be open to everyone i mean anyone can run a blockchain that means an american can run a blockchain and a, and a saudi arabian can run a blockchain and, and a Qatar can run a blockchain. What, what what would it mean for uk if, if essentially your block your land registry is controlled by foreign entities it may, it, it doesn't seem to to make make logical sense, you can do it. But were they, were why? they proposing a public permissionless blockchain or? Yes, yes. Well, yes. yeah, of course not. <laughs> so, so I said to them, it makes no sense to do, to run it like that. And if you're going to run it as a private blockchain, 
Mm -hmm. Then again, why use a blockchain? Just use any old database structure. It, it, it becomes a question of efficiency. You want to go for the most efficient, effective method. And there are better ways of doing a database. Blockchain was used for Bitcoin because you wanted to have a means to, to enforce a legal or enforce ownership because they were possession outside the domain of any one intent entity. But by definition, you are restricting the domain to yourselves, your own entity. So it's like counterintuitive. Why would you have something that takes away, strips away your power? I mean, why? Okay, it's interesting. Now let, let me let me keep moving forward because unfortunately, I, I, I we may have to do part two of this. But let me let me shift the conversation a little bit. Let's talk about proof of work and let's talk about proof of stake. Let me just take it one at a time. Does the concept of mining um, in any way? And sorry if I'm mispronouncing it. Does it any does it in at all? interact with the concept of uh, Reba, this idea that you're producing new Bitcoin as a result of mining blocks. Is that allowed so, to increase? What's the deal? Well, just, 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 just for you to I'll touch upon that, let me, let me just conclude this point about the Bitcoin. So Bitcoin is considered to be halal mm -hmm. because it's essentially as, oh wait, there's a very important principle in Islam. This is a very, 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 very important principle in Islam. One of the fundamental principles of Islamic law. Everything in this world is we call halal or permissible mm -hmm. by default, unless you have evidence to say otherwise. Okay. So Allah said in the Quran, Who are the khalaq ma fi al He is the one who created for you everything in the earth. So by definition, things are are permissible by default. The only way to have something transferred to being prohibited is mm -hmm. if there's a specific additional reason to remove it from its default position. So Bitcoin, by okay. definition, is permissible. I don't need evidence to prove it to be to me permissible. By default, it's permissible by it being a novel thing. There would have to be a, a specific reason to prohibit that thing, and there hasn't been a thing which, which prohibits that. There is no case that can be made which would make Bitcoin prohibited. So back to the issue of mining now. Mining is a process. Uh, I'm sorry, let, let me stop you because I want to make sure I got that, and I want to make sure the audience gets that too. So in, under Islamic law, there's a pre presumption of halal, if you don't mind me putting it that way. And it's a rebuttable presumption, but you need to have a reason for it that stands up. It's yeah. not the case that something new shows up and you don't know either way. You're actually kind of assuming it's halal unless there's a reason not to. Yeah, so the, the way that Islamic law functions is that we have what's called, we have um, generic rule systems or rule based whereby we depend upon and then if you want to and that, and that would be the flask you can almost call it the fallback and then anything okay. from that you have to have specific reasons for that so for example if imagine i came across a drink mm. and i have no idea is it halal or is it haram so if you ask me is it halal i would probably laugh saying okay why would it be haram because the question, is it halal, is a moot point. It's, it's halal by definition. The, the framing of the question is wrong. If it's a new, novel, worldly thing, it's not, is it halal? The question is, is it haram? Lovely. What case do you have to make it is prohibited? Then you would say, well, because when you drink it, it intoxicates. Aha. Intoxication mm -hmm. is a reason to remove a drink from being permissible to being impermissible. That's a reason to do so. And there are a few reasons that will make something go from uh, being permissible to impermissible, one of the main principles being anything that that, that distorts or corrupts the intellect, yes. that makes a person act irrationally, anything that does that will be um, prohibited by definition. But if it has none of these caveats, then by definition, it's, it's permissible. Which brings us to mining. Again, I have a computer. Mm -hmm. This computer is looking for numbers. When it wants a specific, specific number, which gives a specific hash, is found, this piece of information, this block of information is broadcast to the world. Yes. Is it permissible to do that? Again, wrong framing. It's permissible to do anything you want with your, with your computer. You can do whatever you, you can do whatever you want with your computer. You can you can play solitaire. You can you can play Call of Duty. You can do what, whatever you want to do with your computer. You can do you can crunch numbers. You can do maths, which is basically what mining is. You have to make a case for it to be prohibited to do to do this specific particular act. And there is no case to be made to say that finding a random number that gives a random piece of information, data data packet, a certain form to be prohibited. Mm. And on top of that, it actually falls within another framework, 
which is called Ju'l. Ju'l basically means, um, so here we go. I have a watch mm -hmm. and I lost my watch. So I say to someone, I say, I make an announcement. If anyone finds my watch, I will pay him a five, I'll pay him $500. Yeah. Finds it, $500, like a, a finder's fee. That's essentially how Bitcoin works. Whoever finds the next block gets a finder's fee. So that's that's the framework of mining. Nice. Is, is there a fatwa either from yourself or someone else that is analogizing between mining and and yura or whatever the term was you used for the reward system? What is jura? Jura. I mean, like, jura is just it, so the the the. I mean, just to put it into English terms. Jura is, is essentially the same as is the same as waged. It's like a um, like an agent. For example, if I say to you, whoever finds me clients, I'll give him a cut of the of the transaction. That's a, that's a finder's fee. It's like a, it's like wage labor, but it's it's a it's a generic, non-descriptive thing. It's not, it's not based upon um, hours. Got it. Got it. Got it. Okay, uh, it's not reward per se. It's maybe yes, it's based maybe on on income. Yeah, yeah. So it's it's, a, it's it's the same kind of structure. Um, uh, I mean, I, I I'll be honest with you, and this is not to it's not to it's not to not to blow my own horn or anything, but because I've gone uh, quite deep into Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. um, I've gone, uh, what my fatal I've issued have been a lot more deeper than, than a lot of the fatal that are out there. So a lot of the, the Islamic rulings that scholars have given have been very surface because it's very novel. You don't get it, but you do. Um, but because I have, a, I have a computer background, even mm -hmm. in coding and whatnot, I've had the opportunity to actually go deeper into um, the, the inner workings of Bitcoin, Lightning, and the structure and the formality and the reasons behind that kind of stuff. So when I issued my fatawa, I made it clear to first uh, clarify what exactly is happening. Mm -hmm. And then once you've got a clear understanding of what's actually happening, then you can discuss what's the ruling behind it. And there's a principle in Islam called <laughs> The ruling of anything is an extension of your perception of it. If your perception is corrupt, then no doubt your your ruling is corrupt. And I guess in the coding world, they call it, is it what, a trash in, trash out? When it comes to coding, yeah. putting wrong sure. data, sure. You, you get wrong data out. So likewise, you see a lot of a lot of the towers that, that are anti-Bitcoin or anti-crypto. Mm. If you actually read it, the way they describe Bitcoin is not reality. They've misunderstood what's actually happening because it's not their, it's not their field. It's not their fault. That's for everyone, not scholars, people in hedge fund managers, um, uh, politicians, it's not their field. So it's very novel for them. And only when people get better knowledge of how things work, they will have a better idea of where it slots into the legal framework. But in terms of uh, talking about mining, how mining works, the structure of mining, um, in my in my um, writing, I did a detail exactly. How does mining work? What are miners doing? What's the goal of mining? What is the objective, the incentives behind mining? And then once you've got the clear picture of what actually mining is, mm -hmm. Is it, is it permissible to do that? And like I said, the framing of mining is, is exactly that. The person is looking for a number. Once that number is found, he's rewarded with an X amount of Bitcoin. So in terms of proof of work, mm -hmm. the, re the reason one of the reasons why proof of work is is so powerful and so much in line with, with, with Islamic, um, uh, I would even say heritage and ideology, is that big uh, is that um, Islamic finance or Islamic um, uh, business is mm -hmm. deeply rooted in the gold and silver. We had a long, oh. long, centuries long history of gold and silver. And because you can't get gold and silver except by exerting work to extract the ore and to refine the ore, to deserve owning the ore, you can make easily parallels between that and mining. I've invested money in mining rigs, ASICs. I've exerted, I have spent power, uh, energy in power and I've spent resources to acquire the coin that gives me legal. You can you can you can make, you can make a case that this is this gives me legal um, claim over this coin because I put effort to it. I I mine this mine. Whereas that, proof of that, stake that, is that, different. That, that, sorry, let me jump in. That, that, that's a fascinating argument. So you're you're kind of going back. You're you're you're, you're making a cultural and historical argument about why Bitcoin is more in alignment with Islamic principles than regular money, because it, it's it's gold, the things that make gold acceptable make Bitcoin acceptable. The thing is, if you actually go down, go down, go down that rabbit hole, it goes even deeper than that, because 
even if you look at how, if you compare Bitcoin and gold on one side and fiat, fiat is inherently oppressive because fiat can be issued without the work. It gives, it gives, it gives permission for some to have by will of their status, the, the powers yeah, that be, exactly. permission given to them. Whereas Bitcoin brings money back to how it has always been. If you want to make claim to this coin, you have to earn the coin. And you don't get the coin just because you, you're friends of the king or because you have a license, a banking license. You, you, the only way you get it is either you earn it or you purchased it. You exchanged, um, you exchanged uh, a, a good or service to acquire it. So you can actually say, in all fairness, in a, in a society that is built upon fairness, on all fairness, on all fairness rules, I own this and I deserve it because I paid for it. I earned it mm. or I worked for it. So, okay. Whereas so fear, in, in, is, is in Islamic jurisprudence or in Islamic culture, there's a presumption that to the laborer belongs the fruits of his or her labor. It sounds like. Yes. Yes. Okay. And so, so I mean, there, there's, a, there's a principle actually that, 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 um, for example, every transaction between two people, has to in, has to um, uh, has to also embody fairness. On the what basis do you deserve this money? Which is, I, and I'm going to throw another spanner in the works here. Which is why inherently insurance mm. is is at odds again with Sharia. Because why do I deserve money from you? I had a car accident. My car's now wrecked. Why do I deserve money from you? Well, on the what basis do I make claim? on your money that is yours. And likewise, the premiums I'm paying to you, mm. on what basis do you make claim over my money? There has to be some kind of exchange here where I'm giving and you're taking, whereby it can't be a zero sum whereby either he wins or I win. This way, again, which is why gambling in Islam mm. is prohibited. I make a bet that the, that the bird goes left. You make a bet the bird goes right. It goes right, you win. Okay, wh 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 why do you deserve that? Wh wh how, did you, how did you earn that money? Well, all how right. Do you, how do you make? Let me push on this one. There's there's gambling, and then there's laying off risk. And sometimes to do what we want to do, we have to incur risk. But if we can mitigate it to someone who's better at managing it than we are, sometimes it can make sense. I, I'd say that's an argument for insurance. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I know. In, in uh, that's funny you mentioned that because in the uh, Satoshi Roundtable with Bruce's Satoshi Roundtable, one of the one of the um round table uh, um, events I had or one of the discussions I led I was about I'm sorry I missed that, that, I, you're the reason I'm going to SRT next year <laughs> I had, we had a discussion about um, the Islamic model of fair trade and okay. one of the participants was, ran an insurance company we had a big discussion about insurance and Islam and like I said the whole idea of risk and sharing risk and not not and the thing is one of the one of the be beautiful things about Islam, and, I, and, I, and I'm seeing now that there's a, there's an increased interest in how Muslims or how Islam models business, because mm. at the moment the, the dominant model is a Western model. That's just a fact. Everyone knows how that model works sure. in terms of borrowing and risk sharing and all kind of. Everyone knows how how that is, but not many people not understand how there is the, the, the Islamic model, or I would say the the model of fairness. If you want to take away the word Islam, it's up to you. But the word of fairness is that. Islam is not opposed to risk sharing. What Islam is opposed to is risk transfer. Okay. So for example, so for example, I want to run a business. I want to um, take on a loan, capital, so I can run the business. So I go to a friend of mine and say, can I, borrow, can I borrow from you money so I can run a business? Now, he says to me, okay, I'll give you the money, but I want, I want interest on that loan. I'm going to lend you a thousand pounds on an interest alone at 5% API or whatever. I would say, but interest is haram. Interest is prohibited in Islam. You can't do that. Mm -hmm. And he said, yeah, but what, how, how am I going to mitigate the risk? I, want, I don't get money back. I am essentially giving you money yes. and, and I'm taking on board all the risk. So I want to be rewarded for the risk I'm taking. That's the case for interest. So Islam doesn't say you can't do that. But Islam says, no, nothing else prohibiting that a person can even even earn money from the money he has, but he has to share the risk. So rather than I give you a money as a loan and I get interest, I give you the money as investment. So if you win, I win. 
And if you lose, we both lose. That's the essence of fairness. I eat, and, and on that basis I, I, now, I it. It, It's interesting. We, sorry to jump in. You, 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 what, what I'm thinking in the background as you're saying this is there, there's an issue with insurance, which is moral hazard, which, which I'm sure you're familiar with, which is if I suppose I have a house and I insure it, so it's completely covered, from, say from fire. It doesn't matter to me what, anymore whether or not it burns. It doesn't economically matter to me anymore whether it burns down. So I may be more sloppy with my stove, with the gas, with everything else because I'm no longer I no longer have skin in the game, right? So no, that is that, that's definitely a, a byproduct. But I mean, look 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 from another perspective because that right. is definitely a case. But look look from another perspective. Houses burn down. Yes. Car accidents happen. These are events that are unavoidable on planet Earth. The question is, who bears the brunt of this of these events? Mm -hmm. Now, one could say, if the event happened to me, it happened to me. Why should that be transferred to somebody else? This is the question. You may say, okay, how do I mitigate that risk? Okay, we can talk about mitigation and what you can do to, you know, do this and do that. And like you said, carelessness. If I if I know my house is insured, maybe I don't. Maybe I'll leave the the the, the cooker on the stove and go out and come back and you know because mm -hmm. I know that whatever happens. You know, I, I I behave more riskily. I can be I can be more take more risks because I know that I'm not really dealing with the the repercussions of that, and I think that is definitely part of it. And just, uh, I want to go back to that as well before we before we end this discussion about how Bitcoin mm -hmm. changes the structure of of how people think. And this is why I think that Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. I've always tell people, especially Muslims, that Bitcoin is not only more halal, more permissible than. Than fiat money, it also makes you behave in a more halal manner. Because with I think, fiat, I, I think I'm going to love this argument. Go ahead, this is going to be because great. Because with with Bitcoin, it behaves like gold, and you have the whole idea of not your keys, not your coin. You have to take possession of you. You can't get the coin unless you purchase it, earn it, or or work for it. You can, there's no way you get get it otherwise. And because of that, you view the the reality of this money completely different than if you had a loan and i gave this many i give this example many times to people, to people if i gave you a million pounds or million dollars right now mm -hmm. you saw a house the house is worth a million million dollars but you haven't got the money and i said here you go here's a million dollars you can buy the house you want it's yours guaranteed even though you have the money to buy it you would think twice do i need a million pound house maybe i can do half a million and I'll keep the other half in investment yes. because you have the capital in your hand you think completely different then if i said to you i'll give you a mortgage you're paying back in 20 years you take the house you say okay i'll take the house because you're okay. not looking at the the value of the house you're only looking at the immediate payment plan of acquiring the house that means that you behave your behavior has been completely altered by the the basis of your transaction that's why it's always advocate for people that we should start ad we should start moving towards an asset based economy whereby we actually do business based on our real capacity that i have or the capacity of investors because investors will think differently i will think differently the whole economy will think differently than on 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 a, on a debt based economy if i give you a loan and I'm going to get back in interest. I don't really care too much how well your business is doing as long as I get paid. I'm not, I have no skin in the game, whether your business is successful or not successful. I mean, in top of that, I'll even, I'll even say to you, in top of that, you know, I'll give you the loan, but I want, I want security for that loan. Let's put your house in security. Let's put your car in security. Let's put something to secure the debt. I'm, I'm, I'm actually cutting off all avenues of loss and I'm shifting all of the weight of the investment on your head. So therefore, I'm actually I'm actually facilitating business, which is what they say. Bankers say that these loans they facilitate trade, they facilitate they get the the econ economic wheels moving. Yeah, they do facilitate trade, but I can make a case that they facilitate um, irrational or reckless trade. Whereas if you have your own capital that you invest in, and you are invested in the actual business, you now think more rationally. You you actually you want to know is this per is this person even capable? Of making a profit does he have the skills to even sell the product is even good is is the, is, the, is the product even a good idea like like the dragon's den or i think you guys have uh you guys caught an american shark tank 
you out you ask real questions you know, what's your what's your pnl what's your balance sheet what's your what's your revenue stream what's what's your history you ask these questions whereby loans if you actually go to the bank they're not even asking you what you've done they're only asking you what is your income what's your rent on your, your wages because they're looking at how much they can expect out of your daily income your, your monthly income they're not looking at what your capacity is. they're looking at how much you can pay back the debt and even, even, even if you can't if you think you can't do that they think okay what can i take from you maybe he's got a house let's say i can take it i can put it not be just because of time but I, I i do love it and i do appreciate what you're saying i, I want to get this part in proof of stake yeah proof of stake is a big problem uh and the reason being is uh is essentially back to the question mm. under what basis am i gaining the reward of the stake what what, what am i doing what am i doing to deserve that with proof of work i'm doing something i'm actually i'm actually doing work <laughs> i'm actually working and earning my thing proof, yeah. of, proof of stake however we can we come back to the scenario whereby by definition of owning capital by that reason i'm earning capital which brings back to the, the same if you actually want to frame it what exactly is happening here that's exactly the same frame as an interest bearing loan i have capital and by definition of having capital i get capital there's no risk really involved in that. I, I, I just put it a stake into here, and by by the fact of having, I have it. So proof of stake. I'm not going to say all forms of proof of stake is prohibited, but at least on an ethical basis, it seems to be a, rep, a rep, 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 replicating our current system, whereby I would say I would say if you support two to two and two, I'll say proof of work replicates the gold standard. Mm -hmm. So those gold bugs out there, they'll love that. Where proof of stake replicates the debt-based, credit-based society standard, whereby by definition of having money, I get more money. Uh, and that's part of the, the part of the problem. Uh, and we can go more about the issue of dilution and blah, 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 but, but proof of stake is, is, is definitely a problem. However, 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 there are scenarios whereby proof of stake is 100% halal. I'll give you one scenario, because I know, I know you, you, you have time, you have the time is going. So here's, oh, here's Robert Simon, it, it's so good. I, I can't really stop you. Okay, give me give me the scenario where proof of stake makes is halal. Liquidity pools. So Uniswap. They have some trading pairs, let's say USDT and ETH, or okay. USDT and uh, wrapped Bitcoin. And they need a pool of both Bitcoin and USDT to facilitate a transaction. Yes. So essentially you go and stake both Bitcoin. Uh, or wrapped Bitcoin and USDT, or both Ethereum and USDT, in the state in the pool that is used for the transaction, and a portion of that transaction, the fees, gets distributed to the to the stakeholders or those or those who have deposited deposited their capital. Now, one of the reasons why that is one hundred percent halal is number one, there is actually a shared risk because you could actually end up on the other end. Of mm -hmm. the trade, whereby you end up with all these, you, you end up with no more ETH or less ETH than you had before, more USDT than you had before, and in the net is less than if you just had nothing. You you, you can actually lose net value in a transaction as well as make profit on on, on, the, on the transaction, depending on it is. Mm -hmm. And number two, the framing. How would you frame the transaction? Here it is. You want to run a money exchange near an airport. You see, I've got a shop in the airport. I want to mm -hmm. run a money exchange, but I haven't got the capital. Can you lend me money as an investment and we will share the profits of the money transaction? So essentially, by giving me the capital and getting a percentage of the profits used, you're, we're essentially business part. It's, it's a business partnership. It's not a loan. It's not really a loan. It's a business partnership. So staking that is framed as a business partnership is mm -hmm. fully 100% halal. But staking that is framed as a loan is not halal. So some have said, but I'm securing a network. I have yet to see how that makes sense. How is depositing my capital securing anything? It, it, it doesn't secure anything. Uh, you could say, oh, but you, can, you might, then they say, okay, yeah, because if you act as a bad actor, you would lose your stake. And now, yeah. we, have, now we have another problem. On what basis do you have to take my money? Even if, even if I was acting a bit misbehaved, why are you taking my money? That's theft. How do you have right to confiscate my wealth? So there's so many problems with the proof of stake model. Uh, we can discuss another one, but back to the issue of what is allowed, definitely giving my capital 
to anybody, even a, even a smart contract to do business transaction. And I get a share of the revenues from this transaction activity. That's perfectly halal because that's, that's a basic business transaction, that's basically a business uh, model. Um, and you can almost say that that's almost basically like, like shares, really. Like imagine that I give you, imagine I had a company. I tokenized my company mm -hmm. and I basically distributed dividends to token holders. Same thing. It, it, it sounds thing. a lot to me. It sounds like equity where you get a dividend yeah, yeah. from profits yeah. is more legal. Yeah, yeah, 100%. Because like, like I said, that I would say the tokenization of a business entity is basically the next step of using technology to facilitate what already has happened for thousands of years. In the past, we agreed with shaking a hand and... And, and, and our word. Now we're just making it in a blockchain whereby I issue a token, mm -hmm. I legally bind the, the ownership of this company to, the, to these tokens, and whoever has the tokens gets the share of the, of the profits. That's, that's just straightforward. All right, my, my friend, this was epic. This is epic. This is more much more than I thought <laughs> it would be, and I think we need to teach the class, right? I basically need to arrange a class for you to teach. Um, I, <laughs> This is great. Okay. And that, now I feel like I need to go read up on this stuff so I can process it even more. But you, you, you raise a lot of good arguments. But the, the, the argument, and I'm just, or the position, I may say a better word that you said that really resonated with me is that the, the psychological effect of Bitcoin, because of Bitcoin's similarity to gold, and the fact you have to work to get gold out of the ground, the Bitcoin kind of induces a state of mind in the people operating with it that. I already kind of felt this, but you're tying it into sort of the course of Islamic history and culture, which is a leap I hadn't made. And now I'm like, I mean, even if you think about it, if you think about it, how do you even assign value if it's something that hasn't got scarcity? I mean, how do you even assign value? The fact that something oh, is valuable is because can't. We're, in a, we're in a Star yeah. Trek replicator universe. Yeah. Right. And that's actually, I, that's actually very interesting. You mentioned Star Trek because I'm, I'm, I'm a big Trekkie is that, if you, have, you, have you ever wondered how, uh, uh, what model, what what model the Star Trek or that world? They're all communists because everything is free. <laughs> there, there is no, but there's no a free, work for a wage. Knows. As in, the, the, no, the, everything's uh, you, you have a replicator. Mm -hmm. Any food you want, any tool you want, you just request it. Yep. So the, their their model and their world is not even nothing like our world because there is no real scarcity to anything anymore. You just get whatever you want. Yep. Even yeah, entertaining I mean, the holodeck. The holodeck and the replicator, I mean, you're That's set. <laughs> All right, but, but my friend, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. This can be published in a couple of weeks. I'll share it with the Satoshi Roundtable Group. It'll be published widely. I'll give it to you to share with, you know, with your community. Thank you very much. That. This is a fantastic conversation and dialogue, and I know your time is precious. I know we had, had to, you know, we, we worked together to schedule this. I, I just want to express my gratitude and say thank you very much. Well done. Okay. And if, if I can have a final word, and was watching, I would like to say to everyone, that one of the things I think that that even non-Muslims can benefit from the Islamic law, I'm not suggesting that everyone who looks at Islamic law becomes Muslim, I'm not suggesting that, but at least we can look at what, if we had a framework of fair trade, mm -hmm. what would that look like? I think it would be good for everyone to explore what 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 is a, the, the framework of a fair and just market, what would that look like? Mm -hmm. I think that's something that, 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 we, that people should, uh, should look into and maybe consider. Other than that, we'll finish. I, I, I'm with you. I think that's going to be the next show. <laughs> okay, I'm going to start the recording. Thank you.